Well, thank you very, very much. It's always a great pleasure to be on the Santa Cruz campus. My wife said to me some years ago, she said if she were to be a student again, uh, she would want to be here at uh, Santa Cruz. And each time when I revisit the campus, I realize uh, the wisdom of her views on the matter. Now, I'm a little tired today of uh, be answering questions about how I'm enjoying retirement. <laughs> Uh, and what the what the water the ocean water temperature is in La Jolla and the like, it's true. I've been uh, retired for nine or ten days. I'm not sure of the exact number. During that period, I've uh, taken a trip to Washington D.C. My uh, I have no access to the internet. I have no computer. The only thing I I have no fax machine, but I do have a telephone and it rings all the time. So. <laughs> It's been a chaotic uh, few days, but I must say it's a real pleasure to be here and to participate in the uh, Clark Kerr Symposium. Uh, let me say, uh, as a number of other speakers have indicated their relationship to Clark Kerr, I've, I have known Clark since the 1970s with the Carnegie Commission. Uh, while I was uh, chancellor at San Diego, I met with Clark at least uh, two or three times a year, and uh, it was always uh, very inspirational to talk with him about the university. But once I became president, we met at least once a month, and uh, I must say, Clark, uh, through these last eight years, has been quite phenomenal in his ability to uh, deal with complicated problems and provide advice. I think some of you may know that he did have a stroke last summer, and uh, I saw him about three weeks ago, and uh, he is not the same person that he was just six months ago, but uh, there can be no question about his remarkable contributions to the university, and I must say that I'm very pleased that uh, his book, uh, Blue and Gold, is uh, uh, the two volumes that have been complete. Now, uh, the focus of this uh, meeting is on uh, the public uh, research university in the 21st century, and you're going to have to forgive me, but I'm going to deal with a special case, namely uh, the University of California. Uh, uh, f about four years ago, I authored a paper called The Future of the University of California. Uh, I stand by uh, that paper today. It's on the internet. It was actually published. It would be very easy for you to get a hold of. I could uh, go through the details of that paper today, and I think I would give a fairly uh, important account of the, how the university uh, finds itself at the moment and how it needs to pursue the future. Uh, but I think there are only two factors in that paper that I would like to review today. And one is the financial uncertainty that uh, we find ourselves in and the demographic changes that are engulfing uh, the state of California. But before I do that, uh, and before I turn to those two factors, uh, let me just comment on the fact that I believe the University of California is doing an incredible job for the state of California. The research programs of our university are clearly driving the economy of the state of California. One only has to, despite the problems of the dot-com uh, bubble, one only has to look around at biotechnology, computer industry, the software industry, telecommunications, and note that so many of the developments are tied directly to research that's come out of the University of California. With Don Kennedy here, I must add Stanford, and I should add uh, Caltech, but uh, clearly the great public universities and the great private universities in California have made a difference to the quality of the economy. The industry university cooperative research programs of the University of California are booming. There are some 300 different uh, joint efforts between scientists and engineers uh, or faculty at the University of California and various corporations. And there's been mention already of the Centers for Science and Innovation. Enough is said on that. But in addition, we impact the quality of life in our society in many other ways. Medical care, our five medical centers provide uh, medical services for a large number of Californians, but even more important, they set a standard for medical care in the state. 
agriculture as we know it in the state of California, the most productive uh, agricultural industry in the world, has been driven very much by the work of the University of California and its cooperative efforts with the agricultural community. And I believe our K-12 through outreach programs have made a tremendous difference. There's been some comments today about the dramatic reduction in funding in those programs. I'll return to that in a minute. There's just one that I'd like to mention briefly, and it was started about five years ago, and that's the outreach prog the K through 12 program for teachers of reading, K through three uh, reading teachers. We've had about 30,000. Is that right, Winston? I think we've had, in any event, a very large number of K through three reading teachers who have been in summer institutes run by the University of California, where for the first time they've really given, been given some exposure to what's involved in teaching reading. It's been dramatically successful. One can look at all sorts of measures to indicate the remarkable changes that those programs have made in terms of the quality of reading instruction in the state. And it would be a tragedy if that doesn't continue, and I'm hoping that even with these budget cuts that that will be managed. I'm trying to lay the groundwork here. I want to mention also that I believe that the quality of education at the University of California is, uh, continues to be remarkable. Uh, I think the faculty that we have done remarkably well uh, in recruiting faculty and that we compete with the very best institutions, and when I say that I do not mean Berkeley competing with the very best institutions, I mean every campus of the University of California has competed very much on a level playing ground for the very best faculty. The quality of our entering students I think is better than ever. And uh, the graduation rates, and I think this is something that needs to be clear to the legislature, our graduation rates are the highest in history and the time to degree is the shortest uh, in history. And I think that characterizes all of our campuses. I like to point out that the federal funding going to universities, uh, uh, that is the R&D funding going to uh, universities in the country, that the University of California system has increased its percent of that uh, federal funding over recent years. So we're not lagging behind. Uh, oh, I'm wasting time here now, but I can't resist it. Uh, we got two more Nobel Prizes uh, uh, in economics uh, two days ago for the University of California. I should have timed my retirement for <laughs> Just after the announcement of the Nobel Prizes, if I would have been uh, alert, I would have thought about that. Uh, let me, but though I can't resist saying this, uh, during my tenure as president, the university received 11 Nobel Prizes. And uh, that, <laughs> I, I, I take no credit for that, but it was the most that any other president has received. Clark Kerr was second with eight Nobel Prizes, but what's interesting about these 11 Nobel Prizes is they were really distributed across the University of California system. The University of California at Berkeley got its share, but every other camp, the other campuses did uh, extremely well. So I think uh, what I'm trying to say, and it was Marcy commented on it a little earlier in an opening remarks this morning, uh, we have really created in California a remarkable public uh, state institution. Uh, it's widely accessible. Uh, it would have been very easy to create a widely accessible but good state university. On the contrary, we've created a widely accessible and great uh, University of California. But clearly, now to turn to these two factors, uh, the issue of the fiscal viability of the state is going to clearly impact on this institution. I think most of you know uh, the numbers that I'll cite here, but for the few that aren't familiar with the budget of the University of California, let me say that over the last three years, the University of California's enrollment has increased 18 percent, and the funding from the state of California has been reduced by 14 percent. Another way of thinking about that is that 
Uh, we have a partnership agreement with the governor, and I assume the new governor hopefully will have a similar type of agreement, but he'll put a new name on it, just as this governor put a new name on what was called the compact from an earlier period. But this is a partnership that indicates that if uh, the university does certain things, and I won't go through the details, then there will be a certain minimal level of funding that will be provided by the state, and that's tied to certain uh, indexes and the like. Uh, by that partnership, the University of California in this coming year should be receiving from the state $4 billion. Uh, what we will actually receive from the state is $3 billion. Um, now, where is that billion that we should have? And by the way, that has always been viewed as minimal. We, uh, during a good part of uh, the late uh, 90s and early uh, 2000s, we were funded well above the partnership. So there's been this dramatic cut. The question then is, you know, where is that money uh, gone? Well, about 40% of it has been taken up in cuts in programs. And by cuts in programs, I mean cuts in administration, cuts in faculty, cuts in support services, and the like. Another 40% of it has been due to the fact that we've not provided salary increases for faculty or staff. Uh, that's a very serious problem. We're falling behind on uh, those salaries, and uh, uh, the, the date is not in yet for next year. But the salary issue will be clearly a very important factor in our ability to continue recruiting the very best faculty. And then 20% of that shortfall is due to an increase in student fees. Now, some people have been a little stunned by the size of the uh, increase in student fees at the University of California. Let me say that we have the best financial aid system of any public university in the country. I think one of the best financial aid systems of any institution in the country. And that any student or a family who earns less than $50,000 a year is not going to be significantly impacted by these uh, uh, changes. But uh, what is clear is that the state has a huge budget problem. Uh, the uh, latest estimates uh, from the uh, Department of Finance are at about $8 billion. But I think everybody believes that's uh, very low and that it could run uh, another six, seven billion above that. If the governor does, if the governor-elect does repeal the vehicle license tax, that's another three billion. So the state of California is really dealing with a huge fiscal problem. Now, let me just go in a slightly different direction, but uh, then the issue is, uh, what about California? How quickly will it recover from uh, uh, the problems that it's facing? Well, there's some sobering statistics with regard to the job market, and here I'm going to quote directly from Tom Campbell, who is the uh, dean of the Haas School of Business at the University of California. And he's got this list that he likes to bring out on occasion, and it's always caught my interest. Uh, according to Tom Campbell, California has 45% higher electricity rates per kilowatt on average than other western states. We're the only state with paid medical leave of six weeks. Our minimum wage is the highest in the country. California businesses pay 67 percent above the average in workers' compensation. And we're the only state in the nation in which time and a half or overtime kicks in at eight hours a day rather than at 40 hours a week. Now, I'm not commenting on this because I think these are bad things. I think medical leave, the higher minimum wage, are very good things. My point, however, is that I think businesses, as they look around to decide whether they're going to expand in the state of California or go somewhere else, have to have these factors in mind. Uh, I think it is clear that we have not been a state, and I know some people will object to this, but we have not been a state that's been f friendly to the private sector, friendly uh, to business. Now, our situation at the university, I'm still on finances here. I'll get to the dem demography in a minute. But our situation in the state of California, that is the University of California's situation, is 
more precarious than many other institutions. Uh, for one, we do not have the funding guarantees of Proposition 98 for K through 12 and community college education. Secondly, we're not protected by uh, caseload uh, requirements in the law that ensure, for example, for the prisons and health and welfare guaranteed increases. It's uh, interesting when you look at the state budget to realize that at least two-thirds of the budget is beyond the control of the governor and the legislature. And some people would say two-thirds is a low estimate. Some people would argue 80 percent of the budget of the state of California is outside the control of the governor and the legislature. I will sum up this set of ideas with uh, the remark that I think that if we are going to deal with some of these fiscal problems, the uh, Democrats in the legislature are going to have to recognize that without a flourishing private sector, there will simply be no revenues for social programs. And the Republicans are going to have to recognize that without a stable public sector, the private sector is uh, going to be crippled by social dysfunction. So I hope the Republicans will change their style with regard to the issues of absolutely no increases in taxes. I'll try to tie this in a little later with uh, the next point. The next point is with regard to diversity in the state of California. When I uh, went to the National Science Foundation from California in 1975, uh, I came out of Stanford and uh, I think uh, Chuck Young was commenting on uh, how uh, effectively Stanford was uh, working on issues of affirmative action and diversity. But uh, when I left Stanford in 75, the focus was really on African Americans. Uh, no one had really thought a great deal about uh, Asian Americans or about Latinos. By the time I got back to California in 1980, I realized that the world had changed dramatically. And let me comment, and I, most of these remarks are going to be framed within the Latino community, but uh, let me comment that in 1970, about 12% of the K through 12 students in the state were Latino. In 1990, 34 percent of the K through 12 students uh, in California were Latino, and the projection is that by 2010, 52 percent of the students in uh, the K through 12 will be Latino students. And uh, projections out of the Department of Finance have the population of legal California citizens by 2040. There will be 52 percent of the uh, citizens of the state of California will be Latino. So this does not take into account issues of illegal immigration. It's just simply a statement that of the legalized citizens in the state, we are quickly uh, changing the character of the state. Now those, those are, statistics may not be known to you, but the facts are very clear to all of you in terms of the impact. And clearly the university, if the state is to succeed over the long period, is going to have to play an absolutely key role in harmonizing the evolution of uh, the relationships between the various groups in the state. Our problem, of course, is uh, different from Michigan or other states. Uh, we are simply banned from the use of affirmative action. A uh, very difficult matter. Uh, we've worked hard over the last year since 1975 when that ban went into effect uh, to develop our outreach programs, and they have been stunningly successful in my judgment. Uh, over 40 percent of all the underrepresented students who come to the University of California have gone through our outreach programs. But as you heard this morning from uh, several speakers and several comments from the floor, uh, they were slashed dramatically in the prior year and then slashed again uh, this year. So we had a very steep rise in the late 90s and early 2000s in the funding of those programs and then in the last several years just a dramatic uh, uh, cutback. Now 
in all of this, and this is where, you know, people, the faculty and the leadership of the university have to be very clear. Uh, the Latino presence in the state of California is not just numbers. It's in the legislature of the state, and it is a powerful, powerful force, and it will continue to get more powerful. Now, the uh, speaker of the assembly, uh, two, two, two speakers ago, was a graduate of UCLA, absolutely wonderful person, very much committed to the University of California. Uh, this is uh, Speaker Villaraigosa. And he was, in my judgment, one of our best friends. And one day he said to me very clearly, Dick, if my people don't get in, you're not going to get money. And I think uh, from a practical perspective, everybody has to recognize that we have to serve all aspects of this state. And if we think that we can somehow uh, not provide reasonable access to uh, the underrepresented populations in the state, then we're in great trouble. Now, the university has made some major efforts to deal with these issues. I think the eligibility in the local context is a step, a dramatic step forward. What was that? Uh, most people don't quite understand what it was or is, and that is that for any high school in the state, if you're in the top 4% of your high school graduating class and you have taken the A through G courses that are required by the University of California, then you are eligible for the University of California. It doesn't mean you'll be admitted to the campus of your choice, but it does mean if you're eligible, you'll be admitted at one of the campuses of the University of California. Uh, that uh, program has led to bringing in lots of kids from high schools that had never sent even a single student to the University of California. But what's most interesting about it is that when we announced this program, it turned out, and it's a little hard to believe, that about 40% of the high schools in the state of California didn't even offer the A through G courses. So kids coming out of those high schools couldn't even conceive of going to the University of California. Well, when we announced that program, there was a revolt among parents, students, and the like in these schools, and now we think that the number is very high, close to 99% of the high schools in the state now offer those uh, courses, and so suddenly the message has gone out to a lot of young people, particularly from schools where kids have not had the kinds of opportunities that they uh, should have had that they can make it to the University of California, but they've got to prepare, they've got to do A through G, and uh, they've got to uh, do reasonably well in the courses. But they don't have to score brilliantly on the SAT uh, to, to make it. The other change I'll comment on is the one that's going into effect this year. Uh, it will apply to the entering freshman class uh, next year, and that's dual admissions. And basically, this is a program that says, look, if you're not in the, uh, Judy, this is going to be related to your comments. Uh, if you're not in the top, uh, I have to explain that for some people, I guess, that you're eligible for the University of California if you're in the top 12.5% of the statewide graduating high school class. Now it's complicated as to how we define that. It's defined in academic, in a very strictly in terms of an academic index, but you have to be in the top 12 percent. Uh, the point about the eligibility in the local context was that there were many schools that never sent students to the University of California because they weren't eligible. Uh, and the eligibility in the local context hopefully changed that situation. But what uh, the dual admissions program says is, look, you don't have to be in the top 12.5% of the statewide population. If you're in the top 12.5% of your high school graduating class, and you've taken the A through G courses, so you've got to be alert when you're in your junior year and you're even your sophomore year. If you're in the top 12.5% of the high school graduating, of your individual high school graduating class, and you've taken the A through G courses, uh, you will be admissible to the University of California if 
you do your first two years at a community college, we will actually admit you as a high school senior to one of our campuses. You will have to uh, complete two years of work at a community college, but we will work with you during the course of those two years in many different ways, in part through the internet, in part through summer sessions uh, and the like, to ensure that you stay with it and that you finish those two years. And uh, when you enter the community college, you know in your heart or you know publicly that uh, you've been admitted to UCLA or UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and if you succeed at the community college, uh, you will be uh, admitted. So I think these are important issues. And I think they do open the university up to uh, a flow of young people from disadvantaged backgrounds into uh, the University of California. But uh, I will tell you, it's going to be very interesting this year for the Regents. Uh, I think everyone recognizes that uh, the university is probably going to have to take uh, yet additional huge budget cuts. And I think increasingly the discussion is that we're simply going to have to limit the enrollment uh, at the University of California. Now when I say limit the enrollment at the University of California, what I'm saying is that all of these young people who we've been saying for years to, you're going to be eligible for the University of California if you take the A through G courses and you're in the top 12 and a half percent of your high school class. We're going to have to say no, that's not going to work this year, possibly for a number of years. Uh, because we're going to have to cut back. So all eligible students won't be admissible to the University of California. That's an interesting development in its own right. But now let me ask you, how do you make the decision to select students from that more limited group? Well, let me think of two extremes. I mean, one extreme is you just pick off the best students. And so if instead of admitting the top 12 and a half, you decide to admit the top 10 percent, you just shuffle off the last two and a half percent. The problem with that is we're going to lose an awful lot of our underrepresented students. Another approach, and there are several variants of this, and I won't, this is not the way to do it, but there are variants that approximate this, is that you do it on a random basis so that everyone in the pool would have a shot. I, I don't propose that, but believe me, there are very good procedures that you can resort to that give that same result where the minority representation stays roughly the same. Well, the regents are going to have to decide on that issue. Now, I say the regents, historically, that's been an issue for the uh, faculty of the University of California to decide upon, but I think this is going to be an issue where the regents are not going to sit quietly by and let the faculty make a decision like that. I think they will be uh, very much involved. I hope that little example captured some of your attention. Uh, so let me say that in both of these areas, in terms of the fiscal area of the state and in terms of the demographic issues of the state, there's no question in my mind that the University of California is a key player, that we have to do the job as it should be done in order to ensure that the economy continues or re returns and is vibrant. Uh, and I was particularly intrigued by uh, uh, is, uh, the uh, gentleman from uh, Adobe this morning with regard to his, his points. Uh, but we, we can play and will continue to play, hopefully, a very powerful role in terms of driving the economy. But then we also have to play a very powerful role ensuring that, there, uh, that the diversity in our society is dealt with in a harmonious way. Now, if all of this is new, uh, if all of this is old, I'm not surprised. Uh, for most of you, you've heard uh, all of this before. But now I propose to say something that I would have never said as president. Uh, and it's probably unwise of me to even raise this. But I clearly have Clark Kerr in mind. I clearly have the master plan in mind as I venture into this final set of remarks. The state of California sends more students 
on to higher education than any other state in the country. Not surprising, we have a very large population. Uh, if you look at the percent of the population that goes on to college, uh, now let me just inject a remark here. I'm going to be a little loose in some of my remarks, but believe me, there's a written description of this. And I could be talking about high school graduates, I could be talking about 18 to 25 year olds, I could be talking about 18 to 29 year olds. The results are basically, uh, they're the same. I'm going to be talking about 18 to 29 year olds because uh, a lot of youngsters uh, stay in college for a longer period, particularly in the state of California. So don't worry about the measure, just believe that what I'm saying it holds no matter what uh, population you look at. So if you look at the, this population of 18 to 29 year olds, uh, if uh, eight, we, we rank eighth among the 50 states in terms of the percent of our students who go on to higher education. We rank fourth among the 50 states in terms of the percentage of uh, uh, young people in the state of California who, who go on to public universities. So that sounds pretty good. At least it sounds pretty good to me. We're sending a lot of kids on to higher education. We're not, I mean, Californians are used to saying that we're one in everything, or at least we used to say that uh, 10 years ago, but uh, we're still very high. We send on a very large proportion of our students to higher education. Should I complain about this? What about the number of students who get bachelor degrees? We're 46th in the 50 states in terms of the percent of high school students, oh, not high school, we're 46, we're 46, we're ranked 46th among the 50 states in terms of the percent of students in this population who eventually get a bachelor's degree. So on the one hand, we send all these kids to college, on the other hand, uh, where we do very poorly in terms of the percent who actually go on to uh, get a bachelor's degree. Uh, what's the problem here? And I, the reason I would have never talked about this before is that I would not would have wanted to sound that I was being critical of community colleges because I'm not being critical of community colleges and I hope that will come through uh, in the, the essence of my remarks. But what is true of the, the state of California is that uh, we rank 48th among all the states in terms of the percent of students that we send on from high school to four-year institutions. Put another way, we send a, we are, there are only, there are only uh, two states in the nation that send more students on to can you figure it out for me? <laughs> uh, good. Thank, thanks, Chuck. <laughs> if I can follow your lips, I'll, I'll be able to get through this. So the point is, uh, we send a lot of kids on to two-year institutions. Uh, to give you a specific here, uh, California has 37% of its college students are enrolled in four-year institutions. Uh, a state like Michigan has 66% enrolled in four-year institutions, and New York has 74%. So the problem here is that we are sending a lot of kids on to college, but they're going into two-year institutions, and those two-year institutions are not ensuring that these kids transfer, transfer into uh, the, uh, the four-year institutions. And I think that has to be dealt with. Now, I talked about dual admission. I think dual admission can go a long way to uh, dealing with some of that by encouraging these students uh, uh, and identifying them early and encouraging them to uh, continue on and pursue a, a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, it is the case, as you look across the country, 
that community colleges organize themselves quite differently. And in many states, there are community colleges that focus almost entirely on ensuring that a student does uh, transfer into a four-year institution and other community colleges that focus very much on uh, the terminal AA degree. And uh, so we have a problem here. And then I, I think this is where I would ask uh, Clark Kerr, if, if I could, to rethink uh, one minor aspect of the master plan. I believe the master plan is a tremendous accomplishment. And I've always been totally committed to it. I think it's been a great thing for the state of California. But when the master plan was conceived, and Chuck Young can give us the background on this, but when the master plan was conceived, a pretty small percentage of kids went on to college. I don't know what it was. Do you have a guess? Uh, substantially lower than it is now. Well, no, no, but really low, yeah. I mean, when I went to college in the 40s, about 6% of uh, the uh, high school graduating class of the, of the nation went on to college. Now we've got over 50% of the nation's uh, high school graduating classes going on to college. And one has to think then, about whether the 12.5% for the University of California and the 33% for the CSU system are the right numbers or whether they should be expanded given the, uh, the uh, changing nature of our society, the increasing importance of going on to higher education, and more importantly, in my judgment, going on to get a bachelor's degree. And so uh, I think that uh, we can focus very much on the transfer function, and we have done that very well at the university. We've worked hard at it. There's been quite a dramatic increase in the number of transfer students. We have an agreement with the community colleges that requires a 6% increase per year in terms of community college transfers. We've met that agreement, but what will happen now with the budget uh, situation is another matter. Uh, the cutbacks in outreach clearly impact in this area, but uh, I think I would say that in addition to dual admission, it's probably time to rethink whether 12 and a half and uh, uh, 33 uh, percent, uh, the UC and the CSU numbers should be uh, increased somewhat. There is uh, an interesting, no, I'm not going to go there, I think I'll stop with that. Uh, <laughs> Let me say uh, that uh, this is a critical moment for the state of California. All of you know the budget director of the university, Larry Hirschman, or most of you do. And he has a wonderful chart showing the fluctuations in state funding uh, from period to period. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, I used to say, and when I first became president, I said that uh, the early 90s were the worst five-year period in the history of the University of California in terms of its budget situation. Uh, and I would say that it was worse than any five-year period in the Great Depression, and that was simply the case. They were brutal years for the university. On the other hand, the last seven, or the last, not this last year, but the last seven, the seven years before that were really spectacular budget years. We recouped a lot of what we lost. We had great developments in our K through 12 programs, great developments in our outreach programs, but now all of that is being compromised. The issue, the last issue I brought up about the percent of students going on for a bachelor degree, it's probably the wrong time to, to worry too much about that given the budget crisis we're in. But it does really raise a question about how adequate higher education is in the state of California. Nothing could, I mean, in my judgment, the University of California does a phenomenal job. And I go back to the numbers I mentioned earlier about the percent of uh, kids who graduate and the time to degree being the best in the history of uh, the uh, institution. Uh, but clearly, we face some critical problems. 
if this budgetary problem uh, does not extend too many years, if it's a two, three, or four year phenomenon, I think we'll manage to deal very well with it. But if it continues for seven or eight years, then clearly the university is in jeopardy. And I would say the state of California, as we've known it, is very much in jeopardy. Thanks very much.